The year is 1879. A young chemist named Konstantin Falberg is at work at Johns Hopkins University tinkering around with chemical byproducts of coal tar. He's exhausted, goes back home for dinner and he picks up a piece of bread and bites it to find that it is unbelievably sweet. He asks his wife if she accidentally added tons of sugar to the bread dough and she says no. And he realizes he had forgotten to wash his hands at his laboratory. So that is how he accidentally discovers the world's first artificial sweetener, saccharin, benzoic sulfamide, isolated from coal tar. Now there's a good chance many of you are thinking, wait, we make artificial sweeteners from coal or fossil fuel? Oh my God, so unnatural. So let me take you back 300 million years ago. To put things in perspective, mammals did not exist back then. We had these giant forests of trees that were more than 30 to 40 meters tall. And when they died, the swampy environment meant that there is not enough oxygen under the ground and that slows down decomposition. So over millions of years, huge amounts of tree matter piled up and got compressed to first become peat, then lignite, then bituminous, and finally anthracite coal. So coal is just 300 million year old dead trees. The reason I say this is that on social media, it's very common to demonize some things because they are synthetic and come from fossil fuels. Whereas some things are considered good purely because they come from natural sources. So if I say no, saccharin comes from coal tar and coal tar is just plant material, it sounds just as silly as claiming that something is good purely because it comes from a natural source that you happen to prefer. Always judge foods on their merits, on what they actually contain and what they do to your body rather than where they come from. So ignore and unfollow any influencer who argues that something is bad just because it came from a fossil fuel. Which brings us back to saccharin. If you're thinking, of course, Ashok did this elaborate setup and made the coal is also from plants argument just to defend saccharin, there is a twist in the tale. In the 1960s, researchers began looking at the effect of artificial sweeteners on animal health and found that very high doses of saccharin caused bladder cancer in rats. And the prevailing regulatory philosophy of the time was to ban anything that was shown to cause cancer in humans or animals regardless of the dosage. So saccharin was banned. Surprised? At the time, it caused a huge outcry because it had become a lifesaver for diabetics in the Western world. Given the per capita consumption of sugary carbonated drinks, saccharin played a huge role in preventing some of the worst side effects of diabetes. So much so that the government actually said, oh, okay, okay, we know the dosage that caused problems in rats is really large and humans are not rats, so we will allow it to be used but with a big warning label. This was 1977. At this point, you might be thinking, oh my God, why would we take a risk like that? But actually, the risk was never significant in the first place at all. And this is a good opportunity to understand how the process of science works in the context of food and nutrition. And there is yet another twist in the tale of saccharin. What happens over the next few decades since 1977 is that scientists now find out that the reason those rats got bladder cancer did not apply to human beings because we do not have the specific proteins that led to tumor formation in rats. So 1991, the FDA in the US withdrew its ban on saccharin. In 2000, the National Toxicology Program removed saccharin from its list of carcinogens. In 2001, the US government decided that the warning label was not required. And funnily enough, all through this time, saccharin was never banned in Europe, a place that is generally far more conservative than the US. So what do we learn from this entire story? One. Natural does not automatically mean safe, and synthetic does not automatically mean toxic. Two, determining the health effects of additives is a long and complex process involving multiple experts in many countries, decades of experiments and studies, and a complex interplay of government, corporate, and academic interests. 
sugar substitutes are some of the most widely and well studied molecules on the planet. On the other hand, an influencer does like three Google searches and two tweets to declare that aspartame causes cancer. Three, despite all of that, the single biggest thing to keep in mind is that even when something is shown to cause cancer in rats in a lab setting, that dose is usually 100 to 1000 times more than what we tend to consume as part of our food. And that is how acceptable daily intake, ADI, is calculated. For example, the European ADI for saccharin is 5 milligrams per kg of body weight. So if you're 60 kgs, that's 300 milligrams. An average person will rarely exceed more than 10 to 15 percent of this ADI. And remember, ADI is 100 to 1000 times smaller than the amount that would have been used in rat studies. Four, even natural substances like turmeric or even individual amino acids that make up protein will be toxic above a certain dose. The dose makes the poison. Which then brings us to the next logical question. How do sugar substitutes work? Humans have evolved taste receptors on our tongue that can detect simple sugars like glucose, fructose and sucrose, which is a combination of glucose and fructose. And biologists believe that we evolved this ability to detect foods that are high in calories. Remember that before agriculture, high calorie foods were not easily available. So those that ate a lot when it was available and stored it as fat tended to survive periods when food was not available. And agriculture and modern civilization is less than 8,000 years old. It's millions of years of evolution before that that gives us our sweet tooth. Sweetness perception works by sugar molecules fitting into taste bud receptors and turning it on and our brain going sweet. So if you can find molecules that also fit into the same sweet receptor and turn it on, but when they get to our small intestine, it should say, I have no idea how to break this molecule down. You have a non-caloric sugar substitute. What you do not want is stuff that breaks down into other things that are not good for you and manage to sneak into your bloodstream. That would be the textbook definition of a poison. So a sugar substitute tastes sweet but provides zero or very few calories. There are three categories. One, artificial sweeteners. These are synthetic compounds like aspartame, saccharin and sucralose. Two, sugar alcohols. These are carbohydrates but are resistant to digestion. So these are not zero calorie but low calorie like xylitol, erythritol and sorbitol. Three, natural sweeteners, which are molecules extracted from plants like monk fruit or stevia. Just so we are clear, saccharin comes from plants that died 300 million years ago. Monk fruit or stevia came from plants that died a few months ago. One interesting new alternative is allulose, which is just a rare sugar found in figs and raisins that is very hard to digest and is about 70% as sweet as table sugar. This is promising because it works like the resistant starch in rajma or chana, which our bodies are very familiar with. As you can see in this detailed table, each sweetener has different properties. They're usually sweeter than table sugar, which is why we only use a very small amount in our foods and also have different additional flavor notes that sometimes people may not like. For example, stevia can have a lingering bitter aftertaste, while aspartame tastes pretty close to regular sugar. Another consideration is heat sensitivity. You can use stevia while baking, but not aspartame, which breaks down at high temperatures. Which brings us to the elephant in the room. Actually, two elephants. The first elephant is, do artificial sweeteners cause harm? And a follow-up question is, are some less harmful than others? The second elephant, are they beneficial for things like weight loss? Let's address the first one. The simple answer, no. There is no evidence that any sweetener is harmful at the dose we tend to consume. Let's see some studies. This study shows that sucralose, even in high doses, does not negatively impact glycemic control insulin resistance or gut health in healthy adults. This study shows that saccharin does not negatively impact glucose tolerance 
or gut health. This randomized control trial shows that there is no difference between artificial and natural sweeteners when it comes to glucose response, which answers our second part of the question. Are there good artificial sweeteners and bad ones? And by the way, many more studies are linked in the description. These are important because health influencers regularly make claims that even if sweeteners do not cause sugar spikes, they cause other issues. And there is no evidence from human studies that that happens. One thing to keep in mind in India is that pan masala tends to use saccharin, which is E954. And those who are addicted to pan masala will likely consume more than the acceptable daily intake of saccharin. But even at that dosage, the risk to your health is vastly more from the carcinogenic ingredients like areca nut in the pan masala, not the saccharin. Of course, there are studies that show that at extremely high doses in rats, some sweeteners like aspartame increase the risk of some cancers. But to put things in perspective, you'd first have to consume more than 20 cans of a diet drink to even exceed the acceptable daily intake, which and I repeat this again, is 100 to 1000 times less than the amount that showed increased cancer risk in rats, which brings us to the second question. Look, given all this confusing science, are they truly worth it? Are there any benefits? Can we not just consume sugar in moderation and skip these things? I wish it was that simple. So the answer is complicated. Sure, sweeteners do not cause cancer, damage your gut or glucose tolerance, but do they help in any way? It depends. If you are a diabetic or pre-diabetic patient who enjoys eating sweet things in life, sugar in your tea or coffee, sugary carbonated drinks, sweets, etc., switching to sugar substitutes is undoubtedly better for you. Honestly, it does not matter which one because the average daily use is going to be too small to make any meaningful difference. So don't break your head. If you're someone looking to reduce your weight, then sweeteners can help you with that goal, but only a bit. The evidence is mixed. For sure, just sweeteners alone will not help. You still need to reduce overall calories, do more exercise, and so on. If you are a healthy person, just looking to pick up healthy eating habits, then eating less sugar is a better long-term bet than switching to sweeteners. But do what works for you. We are not all the same. The behavior rituals that work for each of us are very different. If sweeteners help you meet your caloric restriction goals while allowing you to enjoy sweet things, go ahead. But if you can achieve it without using them, that's good too. There is no single path to good health.